I know that your timetable might be in some cases much more heavier than mine. <laughs> so oh, really? <laughs> yes. Hello everyone and welcome to this 2021 series of the Caradoc interviews. I'm Gaël Vitali Derian for Caradoc Careers and Doctors Association, aiming at helping doctors, PhD students and postdocs finding their way and their career. We are interviewing today Tina Swami Yarvi, a professor in University Paris Saclay who is a teacher uh, in physics. She was a pioneer in English classes in France. And she's also a researcher in uh, astrophysics. And she has been, she has won a lot of prizes, uh, among them the Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite for her research in physics. Welcome here, Tina. Thank you very much. <clears throat> hello, hello, everybody. So how are you feeling today? I'm feeling fine. The weather is nice, and uh, yeah, <laughs> this is already a good point uh, to start the day. Yeah, it's true. So thank you for being here. Can you begin by telling us a bit more about yourself, a global overview of your life as a researcher? Okay, so I came to France uh, a long time ago as um, for an internship actually originally then decided to make phd in france and uh, after that uh, make a short postdoc also in france and got a permanent position in uh, university and um, i'm working uh, <coughs> first i was working in nuclear physics so my phd was on experimental nuclear physics and then uh, later on, I moved more towards astrophysics, and uh, I'm working now and already since 20 years in the field of uh, astroparticle physics. And my, my job is, I actually, as a university teacher, you can say that I have two jobs. One is uh, uh, teaching and developing uh, teaching programs, and the other one is research. Yeah. So you said that you uh, moved in France at the beginning for an internship and then you stayed here. Can you tell us a little bit more about the um, challenges and the difference between uh, living in France and I mean the, um, the main thing that you face as a foreigner living in France? Yes, of course, uh, I came from Finland, which is uh... Uh, still a European country and not so yeah. different uh, from France. Uh, so uh, in the cultural point of view, it was not so difficult. However, of course, as you all know, French language is challenging. And when I came to France, I didn't speak, uh, well, perhaps few words of French, but uh, not much more. So I needed to, to learn French. And this actually, uh, I learned because I was discussing with a lot of people and in the laboratory discussing with the uh, uh, technicians, engineers, and uh, of course, other, other research people who some of them didn't speak any English. Yeah. So for you, the main issue to face is the language. Uh, well, um, I think it is one uh, one issue for students who are coming for uh, to France for physics. They typically don't know so much French language. Of course, in France, there's a lot of students uh, who come here to study, for example, uh, history, culture, or even French language, and that they don't face the same uh, difficulties as students who come for for more, te more technical uh, uh, domains. So it was one, but of course it's not, uh, it's not uh, perhaps the, the most difficult, but I would say that uh, when you go to work in a laboratory in every, every country, it can be whatever country, you are facing some difficulties because uh, you come to a work environment. So it's not, uh, of course, only language, but uh, if I compare differences between my home country, which is Finland, and then France, uh, basically the differences uh, were related to language. Okay, I see. So now we're going more into precision and 
now that you showed us a global overview of your career, can you tell us a bit about uh, one day, one typical day of your life as a physics professor? Well, of course, uh, uh, we have uh, these two jobs. Uh, so I, I do research, but uh, I also uh, work for university and, um, and related to both uh, uh, these as aspects. Uh, we have a lot of administrative work to do also. We have a lot of commissions and, um, and uh, meetings and so on. So if I would think about, um, let's say a typical day uh, is that, uh, well, I, I'm discussing with um, my PhD student, of course, because uh, we are planning uh, what we do with the, during the next days and so forth, preparing for conferences, preparing papers, and uh, then uh, I typically have a lecture course of uh, two hours or three hours. Of course, uh, this year it's easier now because uh, we do lectures in what is called in French presentiel, so the students yeah. are there. Uh, so I feel it uh, more interesting and more easy to, to teach in this way than what we did last year. And then, of course, I, I come back, uh, I come back from my teaching and then uh, uh, in some cases, I will have a, a video conference uh, in the afternoon, like three o'clock or something, because I work for international research projects. And due to time differences, for example, between US uh, or Argentina, I'm working for an observatory which is located in Argentina. Yeah. Uh, all, uh, all these meetings are in the afternoon. So let's say this is a typical day when I'm uh, when I'm at home, uh, I mean, in France, of course, uh, uh, we travel a lot also because uh, we are working for international projects. So let's say 20, 30 percent, 20 percent of my time, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm traveling. Yeah, so it's between like being there in the university teaching and being abroad, sharing uh, about ideas and science. Yes, we have a collaboration meetings, uh, which typically for us, uh, we're located in uh, on our observatory site, uh, for example, in Argentina, for uh, one of my projects. Uh, and uh, there we were discussing, uh, we were discussing uh, new ideas, yes, and how we go on with the observatory, what are the problems and what are the new results. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's like teaching and also you have to be there to control the, the, um, the workflow of the observatory. It's in uh, Atacama Desert, if I'm not wrong. No, uh, this is another project, I'm sorry. This, I, I work for two pro projects. Uh, one is Pierose Observatory which is located uh, close to the Pampa area in Argentina. Oh. And uh, the other project, uh, which is right now under construction, is uh, the Cherenkov Telescope Array Project, CTA, which will be in La Palma Island in, in Spain. Uh, and then the other one uh, in Chile, close to Atacama, as you said. Okay. So yes, these, uh, these projects, uh, I'm also, I have to say, I work in a field where our observatories are in very exotic, exotic places. Because yeah, they are. <laughs> we need clear sky and uh, no population around, uh, no houses, uh, no cars, no streets. Yeah, of course. So thank you very much for this introduction. Now we are going a little bit in detail about your role in uh, the world of education. So your role as a professor and a teacher. So you um, are uh, you created several programs, and you were you have a really important role in a graduate school. So. And um, also to, to mention again that you were a pioneer in the English teaching in France, which is now very common, but it, has, it had to be started at some point. So how would you describe the importance um, for a researcher to take place in education of the role of the researcher as a teacher? I think uh, this is uh, really fundamental because uh, research is, of course, uh, very strongly linked uh, to education because uh, 
Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the new ideas we have on research, uh, we teach them to the next uh, generation of, uh, of course, yeah. people. So there is a very strong link. And I think also this is um, something which is very interesting in, uh, for research in itself, simply because uh, we are in contact with uh, young people who might have uh, other ideas and who might bring us uh, something new in, in our research. So I think uh, I have always liked this very strong uh, coupling between uh, teaching and uh, research. And of course, uh, uh, this goes together with uh, developing new teaching programs, uh, which, which we uh, hope to be in adequation of our new research ideas, but not only that, but of course we worry about the future of uh, young people. So uh, we need to need to make sure that they will in the end find job either in research, as I said, or in uh, other, other sectors like industry or other non-academic uh, positions. Yeah, like entrepreneurial. Yes, this is very interesting. And uh, of course, I think uh, we, we must realize that the research is also done in, um, in companies and yes. in the industrial world. It's not only academic research we have. And um, it's in, important that we somehow try to help students to be part of this research also and get jobs uh, in this part of the research. Yeah, so it's about, um, so you are creating new master programs, so it follows uh, the path of science, and also you are um, accompanying the students in their career, so that's why it is important. Yes, uh, as examples I can give, uh, I was part and initiated this uh, development of um, uh, phys physique applique, applied yeah. This was um, a master program in France uh, still. It was, uh, I think we started 2003 or something like that. And uh, there we developed uh, new teaching programs, uh, which, which, were, uh, which were, for example, medical physics and environmental physics linked to a new master, which was environmental science. And uh, uh, also uh, a very strong link to energy. And uh, this was not actually, this was something linked to uh, the big uh, problems that we are facing today. And uh, it was uh, absolutely uh, ne ne necessary to develop this kind of teaching programs, not only to do research, but face these uh, problems which are coming from the society. Then uh, the second program was uh, general physics. It was in English and it was very much related and it still is to related to research, pure research and uh, destined to foreign students, but not only also to, uh, to English speaking French students. And uh, here the goal was really to teach, uh, teach uh, how to uh, do research in, in laboratories and uh, uh, fundamental research, not so much applied physics, but uh, fundamental physics. Yeah, so in one hand, you have to tailor the master, the teaching to the current problematics, current problems in the society, and also to the state of the art of science. Yes. Okay. And this is, of course, uh, it's very challenging and uh, uh, but I would like to say that it's also very interesting because um, as a researcher in uh, the field of very fundamental science, for me, it was very interesting to, to develop uh, teaching programs which, uh, which were very strongly linked to other fields. Uh, uh, for example, in the various fields in the, in the field of uh, environmental science. So I would say that the, uh, this kind of opening to other sciences is also profit, uh, for profitable for our uh, our fundamental research in physics. Yeah. And more about the technical issues in creating a master, can you tell us about the challenges that you have faced in creating new programs, the master program and also the graduate schools? Of course, uh, we do this, I'm not doing this alone. So basically you build up a working group uh, composed of various uh, university teachers and uh, each of them um, 
bring their um, uh, own domain and own uh, expertise uh, to this te teaching program. So first uh, is to, to build this kind of working group and put uh, university teachers together. And then, uh, of course, a uh, very important point is to, to match uh, this program uh, for, um, for example, if you are uh, creating a master program, you need to match it uh, to, um, to bachelor uh, degree and bachelor programs. And yeah, then of course. of course, you need to make sure that your master program after this master program, the students will either find PhD uh, positions or can go to, to work in other domains such as industry or other non-academic domain. So I think, uh, uh, this is very challenging. And uh, of course, then you come to technical problems like a simple timetable for, for students and then uh, requirements from the Minister of Education, which yeah. are very strict concerning timetable and so forth. But it's, I would say it's interesting. And uh, it is something uh, that we we do continuously, actually in university, we, we need to, to check that our programs match uh, uh, what we what is required and uh, what is the most recent development in science and uh, society so it's a continuous tailoring and matching and yeah and creating like the course that fit perfectly the mm -hmm. all of these problematics yes we uh, we update our courses uh, i would not say continuous but uh, uh, every four years or so, and uh, we need to also, uh, Minister of Education is also checking uh, that our programs are uh, coherent and university is checking, of course, first, and then then it need to match the, the Minister of Education requirements. Okay, I see. So thank you very much for all this information about your uh, daily life in the world of education. Now, um, if you agree with that, we are going to talk a little bit in, about the other part of your job, which is research and your um, life as an academic. So um, you mentioned that your job is basically two jobs. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your way to manage your time for us PhD students to be able to manage our time also? And do you have some tips and recommendation? I would say that you need to be very well organized. So of course, <laughs> <laughs> well, mostly the students are already because they have very tough timetables. And, um, <clears throat> but, um, uh, personally, I, I use uh, my uh, agenda from uh, my computer to, to check uh, every day what is uh, my timetable today. Or typically, I check uh, like during the weekend how my next week uh, will be to prepare for the next week. But sometimes it's uh, challenging because uh, um, not only because uh, we have teaching duties and then you have uh, meetings and other things for research. Uh, but there is also a lot of uh, administration duties and uh, yes. sometimes it's very challenging and also one thing that is challenging is to match uh, uh, different time zones uh, when you are working in international so if you have at the same time uh, like uh, researchers from china and then on the other hand from us it becomes uh, quite difficult and um, as an example i can tell you in one one project uh, we have meetings at 10 o'clock uh, 11 o'clock in the evening simply because we had the people from australia together with argentina and us okay yeah uh, there is a lot of uh, these kind of uh, things but still i would say that uh, matching the uh, time zones it's probably uh, probably easier than uh, travel all the time to meetings of course mm. <laughs> So your, um, your tips for us to be prepared for this kind of life is really to be well organized. I would say yes. It's, I think as a student, you are already trained to be well organized. I know that your timetable might be in some cases much more heavier than mine. <laughs> so, oh, really? Yes. yes. Uh, students are very, very 
hard timetables. I can tell you this because I have been preparing these timetables for students. Yes, time. it's I true. It is impossible, but uh, yeah, for everything, I think you need to you need to be well organized to to manage uh, your stress. First of all, uh, you can hear a lot of good tips to manage your stress uh, nowadays, but it it is important. And then one thing that I I use a lot is that if I'm uh, in a meeting or somewhere, I fully concentrate to this meeting which is in hand. I'm not uh, doing uh, several things at the same time. So okay. I concentrate uh, to one thing and then I move to concentrate to the next thing. And I would say that at least in my case, this helps a lot and this is efficient because then I'm fully efficient in a meeting and I'm not doing something else at the same time. Yeah, this is a great advice because the temptation to do several things at the same time can be strong and maybe for some people it won't be so efficient. So yet, thank you for sharing your tips with us. So the next question is also going to be more technical. So you as a teacher and as a researcher, you are on a lot of projects. Can you tell us uh, a little bit a little bit of advice and also some tips to get funding for these projects. You mentioned that the administrative part is very strong in our in your job and in maybe our future jobs. So can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yes, of course, it is uh, not student alone who is looking for funding. So yes. it is uh, the job of a whole research group or even uh, uh, even uh, the job of uh, funding agencies uh, in France, for example, who are looking uh, for uh, uh, European funding, for example, and so forth. So uh, one point nowadays that we, we have been discussing a lot uh, in research in France is that uh, uh, there are several, uh, perhaps too many, places where we can ask funding. And uh, this, of course, when the number of these, uh, these places um, uh, where you ask funding, Europe or France or uh, the multiple uh, things that you can uh, uh, do this. But um, this means also that you spend uh, quite a lot of time making applications. And uh, this is something yes. which, which is not so so profitable for research. And this has been increasing a lot during my, my time in, in research. And I think it's not only a problem of France, it's a more general problem. And um, now for students to find funding, uh, for example, of course, uh, you, will, uh, you will look for funding for your PhD. This would be the first uh, step. And I would, uh, would suggest that you, you find a research group, a good research group, uh, who can support you and uh, look funding for your research project, uh, your PhD project uh, for you. So in physics, uh, this is how it works. It's not like a student is looking alone for funding for his PhD. Student first uh, looks for a research group and people with whom he or she is going to do her PhD. And then uh, it's important also that um, this research group is doing research, which is somehow, uh, somehow uh, already having some funding or somehow an accepted research project in France. Of course, uh, sometimes there are new ideas and you want to do something else and not be in the main line of research projects. And uh, this is uh, completely uh, acceptable also. But I think uh, you are not alone and you, you should uh, find a, a research group who is supporting you. So in physics, uh, it's more about teamwork, this funding question. Yes, uh, this of course depends uh, a little bit on uh, which type of physics you are working on. But yes, we have, uh, in my field, we have a uh, very large international projects. Uh, so it's a lot about teamwork. Uh, we work in international working groups. Uh, for example, the CTA project, we are about 1,200 research uh, people from okay. all over the world. And uh, then this is organized uh, 
in uh, various tasks, working uh, working packages, and you are working uh, uh, like this. So it's it's really a lot about teamwork, and this is something which is valuable wherever you go after your PhD. This is something that you you should uh, put uh, forward in your CV when you look for position for is for example in industry. So yeah, you mentioned about this thing being important when we finish our PhD. And so that leads us to the next question, in, which is um, about after the PhD, what are the things that can make you, that can help us uh, get a position, especially in research, because now it's really complicated due to the limited number of places? Yes, um, first of all, I. Nowadays, uh, in, in France uh, and also in all other countries, uh, you should make a, a postdoc uh, one or two years, and typically yeah. it's now two years. So actually, you you should uh, find a postdoc position which is not completely different from your PhD studies, but which allows you perhaps to open a little bit uh, to something mm -hmm. else also. Uh, somehow to increase your competencies. Okay. And, uh, you should uh, typically, if you, if you are a French student, uh, they look at uh, positions uh, abroad, but uh, you should go to a country or to, uh, to a research group um, for your postdoctoral position, which is also strong. It's, it's not only that, yes, <laughs> you by yourself, you are interested in this and you want to go exactly to this country because you like this country. You should think that uh, this is only something temporary and uh, it's important, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, following of your training. It's important that this period of two years is most profitable for you. And you must always think that this is part of training and uh, your final goal is to get a permanent position or job, uh, either in research or uh, somewhere else. So basically it's staying open-minded uh, on our skills and also on what we want to do. Because we, if we don't want to have like a specific position, it's not the good way. We might stay open-minded to all the opportunities. Yes, but you should not, uh, you should not either jump from one type of research to another one because okay. this is a continuous training. So when I say um, uh, open up a little bit, I don't mean that if you are doing uh, astrobatical physics, you move to particle physics. Uh, this, even though the, it might be um, such a big uh, jump, but um, you, you must somehow have a continuous training and uh, and uh, strong research groups uh, supporting you. And also think that uh, you, you would a little bit change your research if you do exactly always the same thing. This would mean that you are a little bit too, too narrow-minded somehow. Yeah. So you are not learning anything more. So you should be able to learn something more uh, during your uh, postdoc uh, position. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so do you have some final advice for us as PhD students and postdoc students in 2021? Well, here I come back to what you said. You must be open-minded. Yes. <laughs> in this way that often I, I see students uh, who really want to do exactly this type of research and they are very interested in this and whatever happens they want to do the, this type of research and uh, this I would say that uh, uh, might not be always uh, very profitable for, for students. In this sense you should be a little bit open-minded because you should always think that your final goal is to, to find a job in the end. Yes. You are in a training phase and uh, it's also interesting to, to have, like I said, uh, uh, some other type of training, not only continue in, in your own, own road, uh, which might be very important. I don't say that it is not important, but, but uh, in this sense, uh, stay a little bit open-minded and accept a little bit wider views 
uh, which might help you in the end uh, get your position. And then, uh, then always keep in mind that if you get uh, go to research in any way, uh, your research uh, domain is going to change because uh, this is even the definition of research. Yeah. We are going to find new things, new interesting things. So you are not always doing the same thing in your uh, career. So uh, there are a lot of possibilities afterwards to evolve. If you want to absolutely do theoretical physics, uh, but uh, there are more uh, positions for experimental physics, you must not think that, yes, uh, being experimental physicist, you have no way to do theoretical physics. Uh, this this is after when you get your job in uh, in research in academic research, uh, you will have certain liberty and like I said, research in itself is also evolving. Uh, so there will be a lot of interesting things uh, ahead of you. Yeah, so don't cut yourself opportunities, basically. Yes, so this is exactly what you say. Don't cut your opportunities. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for your precious advice. It was really a pleasure to have you there. And um, it was really a pleasure for me to interview you. And thank you for everyone for watching. And I hope this video was interesting and you learned something today. Well, thank you also. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye.